So I'm really pleased to follow on from Pat's, uh, Pat's talk. I'm going to be talking uh, specifically about challenging behaviour and then in children with intellectual disability and particularly those with more severe intellectual disability. And what I don't intend to do is to give you an account of the, the dominant kind of theories and interventions for challenging behaviour, because these are very well documented. Um, but rather, I just want to challenge those a bit by looking at um, some evidence that that may not be the whole story and show you some of the work that we're doing to try and extend things. For those of you who are flipping through your conference packs, I'm sorry. We will post the slides on Cerebra. Um, our papers are available on our website and um, there's a booklet that we've written for parents in the past about self-injury. We're happy to send you a PDF if you uh, email me. So just to give you a, a bit of background, um, the behaviours of interest are uh, aggression, self-injurious behaviour, which I think often stands out as being slightly different than other behaviours. Um, and we'd see these sorts of behaviours in about 30 to 40% of people with intellectual disability. There are some associations, for example, autism spectrum disorder and a greater degree of intellectual disability. We, we, um, down at Kent, they did a follow-up of um, cohort of people with self-injury that I'd looked at for my PhD in the 80s. And there is about 84% persistence over nearly 20 years. In other words, of those children that I saw 20 years ago, nearly over 80% were still showing self-injury. This stuff doesn't go away. Um, we can list the human costs, and increasingly we're encouraged to think about the economic costs. And the um, economic costs, I think, are significantly underestimated. We don't count those well. And we do know there's a lack of appropriate clinical intervention. That the, those figures were 1987. We've got roughly the same figures in Birmingham in uh, 2010. So it, Pat um, described quite nicely how many challenging behaviours can have a kind of communicative function and can be, as Pat said, utterly understandable. So a challenging behaviour may occur. This is a sort of operant learning model. You'll probably be familiar with it. But a challenging behaviour can occur. Other people will find it aversive and will act. Of course they will if they find a behaviour to be problematic. And they may engage with the child and a number of different strategies to try and get the behaviour to stop. And of course, those things can be rewarding. Contact from other people, no matter what it's like, can be rewarding. That strengthens the challenging behaviour. And the next time the child is in that situation, they'll show the behaviour again. So you'll be very familiar with this kind of operant learning. And this is the model that we tend to use to try and explain, assess and intervene for challenging behaviour. But I want to just suggest that that isn't the whole story. And there are a couple of other things that we really need to start to look at. So I'm going to just show you why I think that that is um, not, uh, is neither a necessary nor sufficient account. I want to look at a competing uh, explanation talk a bit about some psychological characteristics we've been interested in and show why they might drive that model harder or um, result in some, some differences. I want to ask a question about where emotion is in challenging behaviour, particularly in severe intellectual disability, and finish on some of the implications for practice. So is it a necessary and sufficient account? Well, if you look at the prevalence of self-injury across syndromes, it varies enormously. So these are some of the syndromes that Joe Moss was mentioning along the bottom. Uh, and this is a contrast heterogeneous intellectual disability group. And the point is that self-injury is much, much more common in smith mcguinness syndrome, Cornelia de Lange, than this group. Now, if the environmental explanation is... Um, a complete account, we would not see those differences. Why should syndrome make any difference? But it does. The second phenomena, just as an example, is in severe self-injury, we often see people restricting their own movements, so-called self-restraint or preference for imposed restraint. So this is where people seem to be sitting on their own hands. And again, if this was a purely learned behaviour, why do you need to restrict your own movements? Why just not show the behaviour? So there are a couple of things, and there's, there's actually a, a, a series of um, pieces of evidence that may make us think that this is not uh, a complete account. So what I want to do now is, is to talk about um, a competing explanation that I think is often missed. 
Um, and it's not really discussing the self-restraint issue. It's a bit more appropriate to the syndrome issue, but it's got more general applicability, as I think I'll show. And that is that pain and discomfort might underpin a lot of challenging behaviour, and in particular, self-injurious behaviour. So we've been looking at pain in people with severe intellectual disability for a while now, and it's an incredibly difficult problem to address. The only way you can assess pain is to ask someone if they're in pain. It's a, an intensely subjective experience, and that is still the gold standard. And of course, with non-communicating children, that's the problem. So I'll just say a bit about how we've been assessing things. We've been using the FLAC. This is a, a behavioral measure where you look at face, legs, activity, consolability, crying, and you can make a rating. We use the NCCPC, Non-Communicating Child Pain Checklist, and we use something called the QABF, slightly different. Uh, it's a questionnaire about behavioral function, and it there is a pain subscale to identify children whose behavior might be pain-related. And this is some of Kate Eden's work, one of our PhD students, and on the QABF, if we identified children who had a pain function to their behavior, their behavior looked like it was associated with pain, and then we look at their scores on the non-communicating child pain checklist, um, that group score higher all the time across all the subscales. So in other words, the QABF um, looks like it has some convergent validity with a second measure. We're seeing pain behaviors in a group who appear to have um, pain associated with their challenging behavior. Um, the second strategy we've adopted is to look at pain in groups at high risk for self-injury. Uh, and Joe Moss showed um, this uh, very similar slide earlier on, because in Cornelia de Lange syndrome, you see very, very high rates of self-injury, usually around 70%, usually very, very severe. What you also see in that group are a number of physical health problems, one of which in particular is gastroesophageal reflux. And then if we use something like the QABF and we compare the function of challenging behavior in that group with the function in two other groups, Cornelia de Lange and Cree de Chat, then the pain function is much more common in the Cornelia de Lange group. So one strategy that we've adopted to try and address this problem that you, it's very hard to know if someone is in pain and how that's related to challenging behavior is to look at this high risk group. And it seems to suggest, the data seem to suggest that that might be uh, an appropriate explanation for people with that syndrome, for example. The other strategy, and again, this is more of Kate Eden's PhD work, you, you can pose three different kinds of questions. You can say, well, in those people who show challenging behavior, do you see more pain behaviors as measured by the NCCPC and the FLAC? These are independent observations, if you see what I mean. And so again, these are teachers making ratings on the FLAC, face, legs, activity, consolability, crying, watching the children, and then the report of whether they are showing challenging behavior or not. And the group showing challenging behavior are scoring much higher on teacher observations on the FLAC. So again, there seems to be an association between pain and challenging behavior. We can then take here the behavior, the, the, the syndrome of interest is tuberosclerosis complex, in which we see lots of painful health conditions. And we can look in the group of children under 16 with that syndrome and say, if you show self-injury, do you score higher on pain measures than if there's no self-injury? And again, the answer is yes. So again, it looks like there's an association between those behaviors. And then in Cornelia de Lange syndrome, you can say of those children who show self-injury versus no self-injury, do you have more signs of gastroesophageal reflux? And again, the answer is yes. So that first strategy is saying, are we seeing more pain behaviors in those showing challenging behavior? And over a number of studies, we're showing that that's a, a strong possibility, particularly for self-injury. You can ask a slightly different question, which is in those um, with health problems, do you see more challenging behavior? So this is data from Caroline Richards, PhD, looking at around 240 people with autism. And what she shows is that if you have health problems, 
then you're about two and a half times more likely to show challenging uh, self-injury. In children with autism, that's not the case in adults. So the health, what you may say is, well, that's obvious. If you self-injure, then you develop health problems. But these health problems are, again, things like reflux, middle ear infections, and tooth decay. So these problems, again, in autism spectrum disorder, uh, associated with self-injury at this sort of group level. Um, and the final sort of question you can ask is, in those with autism where we suspect health problems, so people who may have a lot of signs of reflux, do we see more self-injury than those who don't have reflux? And again, the answer is yes. So I've shown you a number of sort of comparisons. Because we can't directly get at the pain issue, you have to take a number of behavioral correlates, you have to make some assumptions. But we've done it a number of different ways now, enough for us to say, this looks like there's an association. How do we then pursue that? And I'll come back to that. Um, so this is a, uh, one of two final studies by Kate Eden. So the, the question that Kate then posed is, well, if this is pain-related behaviour, then surely the environment should have less effect. And so for over 20 children, she carried out what's called experimental functional analysis. So she exposed the children to different em environmental conditions. And if you have, uh, if the behaviour is a learned behaviour, as I was describing, then the environmental conditions make a difference. If it's not, then they don't. And what Kate managed to show us it's just down here, sorry for all the numbers, but if, you're, if, if the environment has less difference, uh, shows less, less effect on the behaviour, then the children had higher flat scores as rated by the teacher. In other words, the teacher, over a period of five days, rated more pain behaviours in the children. Kate went in and did the experimental functional analysis, and she'd, in those children, she'd find less environmental influences. So the sort of clinical message coming out of that is something like, if the environment doesn't influence the behavior, one should start to think about pain and discomfort. The last thing that Kate did, I, I thought was a very, very nice little study. So this is the point at which the child self-injures. Three children for whom she could not identify function, but they scored high on the QABF pain function. Um, and what you see, these are pain behaviors. And this is about, um, 10 seconds, these are five second epochs. This is about 10 seconds before the self-injury. You see the pain behavior going up, and there it's going up, completely different pattern for this child who we thought was actually functional, had a learned behavior. But in these two children, you can see the pain behaviors occur in the 10 second window before the self-injury. So the clinical message might be, if you see these sorts of behaviors just before the episode of self-injury, that might tell you that the pain is, is causal. So it, it, I, I show you that argument, to show you converging lines of evidence, some of the implications for um, assessment and intervention. But all of that pales, it, it becomes slightly useless when you read this kind of story. So we were inviting parents to participate in the pain survey, and this is what one parent of a child with Angelman syndrome said to me. They basically said, we tell people that our child is in pain, but nobody listens to us. And that pain signature in the child, the signature will vary from child to child, that's the sort of thing that should be in the yellow book that we were discussing just before lunch. But it's very, very important. Parents know their child's pain signatures, and that information really does need to be passed on. So um, I've shown you uh, a pain explanation about challenging behaviour. I want now to, um, against that background of the operant explanation, we might think that that explanation should be sort of the same across everybody, but there might be reasons that it varies because motivation varies across children. And the syndrome of interest here first is Angelman syndrome, and Joe Moss has introduced this very nicely for us. And you saw in Joe's description and in the video this very, very strong drive for social contact in the children and in the young adults. Um, and that one way in which you uh, can access high levels of social attention is if you show aggression. That naturally is consequenced by a response 
um, and you see high levels of aggression in children with Angelman syndrome. And so I showed you before the results for pain here, showing high levels of pain-related behavior in Cornelia de Lange. And over here, the Angelman's group are showing very high levels of attention-maintained aggression. And so the, the interaction here, the operant theory is running nicely, the operant trap is running, but there's a strong driver behind this, which is the child's drive to seek attention from other people. And we can look at this experimentally. So on the um, left-hand side here, you can see Jane Petty interacting with a child with Angelman syndrome. And then she turns away, and you can see by the look on his face, he's not pleased. He's not pleased with this. And so if our theory is right, then we should see more aggression in this um, condition than this condition. So our analog graph should, should look a bit like that. And then when we expose 20 children with Angelman's, Creda Shah, and Cornelia de Lange to these environmental conditions, um, that's exactly what we see. In other words, in that low attention condition, more children with Angelman sy syndrome would show aggression. So this is a good example, I think, of the operant learning running quite nicely, but it interacts with the child characteristics. Um, just want to show you how um, Lucy Wilde in our team has, has taken that a bit further. And in Smith-McGinnis syndrome, you, again, you see very, very high levels of aggression. Um, and it was reported that the aggression could be attention maintained. And, and we'd done some early work to show that was the case. But what Lucy had showed us in a questionnaire study is that in the Smith-McGinnis group, there was very, very high attachment, to use the term loosely, to specific people. So the children with Angelman syndrome were much more likely to seek out parents than other children and become very, very strongly attached. And she also did some experimental work where she compared children with Down syndrome with children with Smith-McGinnis syndrome. And she showed that the levels of interest in the unfamiliar adult in the Smith-McGinnis children was much lower than the mother, whereas it's about equal in the children with Down syndrome. So in other words, if, if the mother was occupied, the children with Down syndrome would turn to an unfamiliar adult. The children with Smith-McGinnis syndrome would not. They were still looking for their mother's attention. And so the, the, the kind of importance of this is when we've been involved clinically with a number of families um, who have a child with Smith-McGinnis syndrome, um, you can often get a discrepancy in the reports between school and home around behavior. Uh, and the, the reason for that is now becoming very, very clear that that strong attachment may form at home. The children may show very difficult behavior in order to gain access to parents, and you won't see that necessarily at school. So it's a much broader kind of gene environment type interaction. Just to show you one study, even though you may feel that this strong drive for attention can't be modified, uh, Mary, Mary Heald, one of the PhD students, um, did a couple of experiments to show that if you signal attention as available to children with Angelman syndrome and signal when it's not available, and she did this with a, a rather, rather nice um, orange workman's jacket, then over a number of sessions, the children came to discriminate. So in other words, there was a way, although the drive is very strong, you can actually teach the children. There are times when things are available and times when they're not. And so there's a good way there to try and help parents, help the children discriminate between those two, between those, um, two events, as it were. And just a final example, this is Caroline Richards' PhD work. So she does the standard experimental functional analysis. So she's looking at, are the, chil are the children's self-injury, is it maintained by access to attention or escape from demands? And when she does it, um, she's unable to show um, function. She can't get the environment to influence the self-injury in these children with autism. But if she uses autism-sensitive manipulations in the environment, then she starts to get function. So here, when it's escaped from a sensory stimulation or access to repetitive behaviors, these are autism-sensitive kind of events, then the behavior starts to show function. So it, it's about the child characteristics interacting with the learning environment in order to drive the development of the behavior. So I've shown you some of these 
psychological characteristics and how learning theory can, can interact with those. I, I want to just mention behavior regulation. This has become really important in, in our understanding of challenging behavior because, um, and just to show you some of the evidence, I'm sorry, it's a, a terrible graph of just after lunch, but it, what it shows you, if you want to predict, this is around 1,000 children with severe disability. If you want to predict who shows the most severe behaviors, it's those children with high frequency repetitive or ritualistic behavior. So you're thinking autism spectrum disorder doesn't necessarily need to be that, it's just the presence of that behavior. And you'll see it starts to, um, the effect starts to wash out the effect of severity of intellectual disability. In other words, this is a marker, a behavioral marker that seems to be associated somehow with with not just the presence of self-injury, but more severe behaviors. And I, I'll come back to that in a second, because in a number of studies we've shown this, so there's cross different syndrome groups, an association between repetitive behavior and the presence of self-injury, but we also then started to see impulsivity and overactivity as associated. So now we've shown that it's not random who shows difficult, challenging behavior, even in high-risk groups like autism or genetic disorders. If you have these behavioral markers, you are more likely to show them, those difficult behaviors. Just one last example for you. Again, a horrible chart, but here, this is whether or not you show self-injury in autism spectrum disorder, and there are the problems again, repetitive behavior, overactivity, impulsivity, and health conditions that we've shown before. And if you look down here, you start to see self-restraint, the behaviors I showed you of the children restricting their own movements, is associated with overactivity, impulsivity, and repetitive behavior. The idea that we have then is that the contemporary neuropsychological models of ADHD that might account for overactivity and impulsivity, and those of repetitive behavior are about behavioral self-regulation. If that is compromised, you are more impulsive, you show more repetitive behaviors, and that may be why when you develop a behavior like self-injury in a learning paradigm or from pain, the behavior then becomes out of control because you haven't got the neuropsychological ability, if you like, to control that behavior. So we think that overactivity, impulsivity, and repetitive behavior are very important risk markers for later severe um, self-injury uh, or any challenging behaviors. And, and so there is this link between the executive dysfunction um, problems and repetitive behavior and also in uh, impulsive behaviors and, and inhibition. Uh, and so, and that, I think that starts to help us understand how it is that behaviors start to become out of control and difficult for the children to, to manage. Um, just want to finish on emotion. I started life out as an applied behavior analysis where you would never talk about emotion at all. You simply weren't allowed to. It's about behavior, and that was it. But increasingly, we see in smith mcginnis syndrome, prada willi syndrome, we see temper outbursts that are absolutely uncontrollable. Um, and one of our um, PhD students, Kate Woodcock, um, did a quick comparison of what happens in children with Prada-Willi syndrome and Fragile X syndrome when you introduce an unexpected change. Well, in the children with Fragile X syndrome, you get one emotion, anxiety, and the children with Prada-Willi syndrome, you get a different emotion, you get anger. And so it, it clearly says to us, I think, that, that there is a, a different level of behavioral response, if you like, that we need to understand. And we've done a little bit of work on this um, with Penny Tunnicliffe. And this is, a, this is a poster by a young woman with Prada-Willi syndrome describing what happens to her when there is an event that triggers um, change in the environment. And you can see that she's describing a clear emotional change. And Penny Tunnicliffe interviewed 14 families about the changes in their children when these emotional events were happening. And she drew up this wonderful chart, which I know you can't see. But what she was describing was a change from 
emotional behaviors through to difficult, challenging behaviors. And then at the end, this is the bit I'm interested in, and I'll just make that a bit bigger for you. But what you start to see is apology, 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 self-deprecatory speech, apology, apology. The children were very, very remorseful about what happened during those episodes. Now, you can make a behavioral or operant argument about that. It's not a terribly convincing one. Uh, but it's very clear, I think, within this, when the children are so apologetic afterwards and say, I don't know what happened to me, that their capacity to regulate their own emotions during those outbursts might have been compromised in some way. And I think as well as looking at behavior, we need to look at um, that level of emotional control, because nested in there were episodes of self-injury and aggression, for example. So let me finish on the implications for, for practice. I won't keep you from tea. And I, I, I just wanted to encourage you. So, so I'm not challenging the operant model. I'm not saying that that model, that learning theory model, should be thrown. For most people, for most of the time, I think it's a really good explanation. Uh, and the concern should be that it's, the interventions are not more widely available. But I think we have to also think that pain might be related to self-injury, aggressive outbursts, and so on. And I think we, clinically now, it would be the first thing that I would look at. That would be the first possibility, because then we can go to treatable interventions, then we can do all the other work afterwards. But I'd go there first. Alongside that, we may need some advocacy for parents who say, my child is in pain, I think, I want an investigation. We may have to support those parents in being able to, to seek out those medical investigations. The second implication, and um, Louise Handley and our team has done some work showing that these behavioral characteristics are there in uh, very young children. She's looked in the child development centers in Birmingham. And those markers are there even for the very young children. And so we've got a list of markers there that tell us who is at risk, which children with an intellectual disability are at risk. And if they have these characteristics, then they are at higher and quantifiable risk. And so um, what you may think, or, or what are the immediate implications of that, is that, and I'm sure this is being announced today at the Labour Party, but we, we, I'm sure that there will be these <laughs> kind of... Um, new and significant funds. We, I mean, we, we just got to know that this isn't happening, but the point I want to make is that in our practice, we can look for those risk markers and try and do things about it. The operant learning, um, I think, is important, but I think we have to be careful about assuming that um, child characteristics aren't important. If you're a parent dealing with a child who's very impulsive or a child who's very, uh, got a lot of autistic characteristics, I think you can feel that you're really not doing well, and it's not about parent management. It's about some of the child characteristics. And the last thing I would say, just as a, a, a closing note, the lack of strategy, resources, and ownership in this area is, is absolutely shameful, quite frankly. Um, it's not a very positive note to finish on, but it's the one I'm going to finish on, and just thank Cerebra and this group of people who do all of the work um, being on the receiving end of hair tugs and various other things from children so that we can uh, present the information to you. Thank you very much.